Shall I get started? Yes, please. No problem. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Borsak. I'm on the board of directors of the Sunnybrook Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our speaker series discussion this evening with a focus on virtual care and cancer care. April is Cancer Awareness Month, and the Canadian Cancer Society reports that two in five Canadians are expected to be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Some of these patients will come to Sunnybrook for care. Sunnybrook's Odette Cancer Center is the second largest cancer center in Canada. Behind the center's reputation for unparalleled cancer care is a commitment to the unique needs of each patient. Finding the best ways of doing this is a constant evolution. Throughout the pandemic, and along with other areas of healthcare, there has been a shift to offering more care virtually. Tonight's discussion will look to answer some important questions. Is this approach to care virtually the same thing? And how will virtual care fit into the future of cancer care? We have an incredible speaker panel lined up for tonight. And alongside our esteemed panel of presenters, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Calvin Law both presenting and moderating this evening. Dr. Law is the chief of the Odette Cancer Center and is the Regional Vice President of Cancer Care Ontario. He is a cancer surgeon and an affiliate scientist at the Sunnybrook Research Institute. Dr. Law also holds the rank of full professor in the Department of Surgery, as well as the Department of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. This is just a snapshot of his biography. As you can see, we are in very good hands having him moderating tonight's event. Dr. Law, it's my pleasure to introduce you and I'll now pass the event over to you. Thanks so much, Lisa. And welcome everybody out there. It's, it's a little different when we're on Zoom and we can't see you all, but it's just great to have you. And I thought, how appropriate is it to talk about virtual care virtually? And so again, welcome all of you. Um, again, tonight our talk is called, virtu uh, is called, is it virtually the same thing? You know, how virtual care will fit in the future of cancer care. And uh, as Lisa said, we have a wonderful group of speakers up here to talk about different perspectives, which I think are really important for all of us to understand uh, how this uh, works and maybe to engage in some really good discussion. Now our order is gonna switch up a little bit. Uh, we're gonna start off actually with Dr. Simran Singh, uh, who's gonna talk about how virtual care can fit into the overall system of care. Then uh, Ruby Bola and Angela Leahy will present on how the pandemic has affected uh, virtual care and some of the development that happened. Uh, I'll then come in and talk to you from the other hat that I wear, which is as a surgeon, to sort of talk about how virtual care is fit even with surgery. And then we're gonna finish up with Tamara Harth, who leads our patient education, is gonna address virtual patient and family education. Now, obviously we're gonna set aside time at the end of the evening for you to ask your questions to any of us on this panel. And uh, that will come through the chat and we'll uh, so try our very best to get through all of the submitted questions that we can. Um, you can certainly uh, submit these online and uh, please feel free to submit them as we talk um, and we'll collate them for the discussion period. Apologies to all when we can't get to your question, but hopefully we'll have a good engaging evening. And, uh, and from there, uh, we'd like to get started. And uh, uh, let me introduce you to Dr. Simran Singh, a wonderful friend of mine, and also um, a medical oncologist here at uh, Sunnybrook, who's uh, not just an affiliate scientist uh, in our research program, but also has a provincial role uh, in uh, Cancer Care Ontario as the provincial head of the patient-centered care program. He's also an associate professor at the University of Toronto, and, uh, and in his past, uh, he did complete his master's degree in public health from Harvard. So this is just a small, small snapshot of uh, Dr. Singh's bio, and uh, we're really fortunate to, to have him here uh, to give us that perspective of how virtual care fits into a system of care. So on that note, Dr. Singh, thank you for joining the panel. Over to you. Thank you, Calvin, and thanks, everyone. I'm really glad to be here today to talk a little bit about uh, virtual care from a bit of a larger uh, umbrella perspective. And I'm, I'm going to wear my uh, role that I have at CCO, which is, as Calvin mentioned, um, the head of the person-centered care program. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today. 
And I'm just going to share my screen here, if that's OK. OK, so hopefully that all looks good. OK, so as I mentioned, you know, virtual care has been sort of a slightly a new area for us uh, in the cancer care world, but really in the health system overall. If you kind of look at where we were, the virtual care before the COVID pandemic, it was a bit of a hodgepodge. You know, we had something called the Ontario Telehealth Network or OTN that people may have heard of, but really it was driven by geography. It was meant to be used for people who lived in areas where they couldn't necessarily get cancer care locally. Uh, and it was to try to get them care. So it was really geography driven. And what that meant was patients still had to travel into OTN sites or satellite clinics, and they would see a physician or a nurse or a care provider virtually, and there would be a care provider actually in that satellite clinic. Now, before COVID, to be fair, there was some new pilots that were involved, and Dr. Law and myself are both part of these pilots, where we were starting to explore using OTN as a mechanism for people to get some virtual care at home, but it was only had to be done through OTM. We all weren't familiar with Zoom at that time. I didn't know what Zoom was. Um, and it, was, it wasn't the easiest uh, way of, of uh, delivering virtual care. At that point, we had no patient experience data. We didn't understand how patients felt about virtual care in Ontario and the cancer system. We didn't understand what are the challenges that patients might experience in virtual care. And we had no payment mechanisms for phone and video calls outside of the OTN network. And even that was somewhat limited into who could and couldn't. So there wasn't a big incentive to move towards virtual care in many different areas. And then, of course, uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic hit. And we got these things called K codes. Now, these were temporary codes, but for in Ontario, these were quite a development because they meant that providers were now able to be remunerated for providing virtual care, which didn't happen before. And so, of course, that drove behavior. So we entered into a whole new area where uncharted territory, where we had to suddenly transition to providing virtual care, but we weren't quite ready at that point about how we should do it, what are the best ways, what are the best ways we can optimize these for our patients. Now, if you look at virtual care, what we were doing in the cancer system, now this is all across Ontario, whether you're a numbers person or a graph person, I've given you both information here. And I think what's what's really obvious here is that we were doing very little virtual care. When it came to what we call systemic visits or chemotherapy visits or visits for people who were getting medication for their cancer. Before the pandemic, less than 1% of our visits were virtual. And like I said, that was mostly geography based. Why by March, when these K codes came out, we were at more than 40%. What a drastic change for our system. We went from delivering almost no virtual care in the province to 40% of our cancer patients are now getting virtual care. Same thing for radiation treatments, slightly more, but it was less than 2% before COVID. And we're looking to all about half of all visits were now virtual. Psycho, the psychosocial oncology, I thought I would bring up this because there was a little bit more virtual care going on in this area, probably some more phone calls, to be quite honest. But when you look at it in COVID, again, the vast majority of people here are now getting virtual care. So we really had to figure out how to transition and how to do this fast. Now, this may say, some people may say, well, this makes sense. Just start giving virtual care and, and start doing it on the computer. And that's kind of what we had to do. But there was a lot of things that we needed to take into account when we were doing this. One of the things was data. We didn't, we, when we do stuff in our Ontario healthcare system, and especially in our cancer system, we want to make sure that we are effective and that we are providing the best patient experience and the best provider experience. We like to do things based on data and Ontario is great for that and Cancer Care Ontario is really good for collecting data and making changes based on that data. We did have a lot of data that we could go to to say, what is the best way to deliver virtual care? What are the good and bad things that we can do? We, in the cancer program, we certainly want to be what we call person-centered. And that really means about understanding that cancer care is a journey. It involves a larger care team. It involves education. It involves making sure that the right people are part of your team. And we have to think about principles like equity and appropriateness. We want to make sure when we're rolling out virtual care that people who maybe didn't have access to computers or felt comfortable with computers or there was language difficulties, how are we going to manage these things on a virtual setting? 
There was the regu regulatory environment that we were trying to understand very quickly. There's issues like privacy, confidentiality, things that we take very seriously in the cancer program, uh, policy, uh, regulatory uh, guidelines in terms of what needs to be delivered, how it needs to be documented, how do we ensure that we're doing the right thing. And then there was logistics. How do how do we have people transition? Uh, in a program like ours at Sunnybrook, we have a lot of learners. A lot of people come and they work with us to try to learn how to become good care providers. And how do we incorporate those learners into virtual care? We didn't really know how to do that. And as well, we wanted to start thinking about new models of care. How can we change the way we take care of our patients better doing virtual care? So a lot of different factors that had to be considered right at a provincial level. And then that's why we decided at Cancer Care Ontario to start looking at this to try to think about how can we best deliver virtual care? As I mentioned, we didn't have clinical guidance. So we decided we need to provide some clinical guidance about what's appropriate virtual care and how to do this. And I'm gonna to talk to you about this in a minute because this has sort of formed the bedrock which we're growing our virtual care across the province for in the cancer program. We also realized technology is gonna be a real issue technology, both at the patient level, but also what we call the provider level. So make sure people have the system is, is ready for this influx of people. Uh, it seemed we're all very comfortable with Zoom, or some of us are more comfortable with Zoom now, but certainly I was not comfortable using Zoom at the beginning. I had a real, uh, it was new for me, and trying to figure out how do I communicate over Zoom was a completely new endeavor, and I think I wasn't alone in that regards. And then, like I said, research and evaluation. We didn't have data, so we needed to collect data quickly. We needed to understand the experience and the outcomes quickly so we could quickly make changes because this was happening very fast. And the key to this is at the bottom of this slide. It's ongoing engagement with patient and family advisors. Uh, at the Odette Cancer Center, but also right across the province, we have a very strong community of patient and family advisors. They're integral partners in every part of every program that we do. And it was very important that we work together as a team, patients and providers together to try to figure out this in a hurry. We did a, a review to try to see if we could, what kind of data could be driven by. And to be quite honest with you, what we found is there isn't much data. There was some data from Australia, mostly telephone and mostly based for people who had geographical uh, disparities or barriers. There wasn't a lot in how do you deliver virtual care to somebody who doesn't have geographical uh, issues, but really more due to the pandemic. So this at least let us know that we, we were not missing anything. So when you don't have data, one of the ways you can do this is you can bring together experts and you can try to make a consensus statement. And there's ways to do this so that it's not one person's opinion, someone loud in the room doesn't sort of overrun the larger opinion. You can actually do this in a very systematic way. And this is called a Delphi approach. And this is what we did. And the reason I bring this up is you can see here, we had a lot of people involved. We got a lot of doctors from a lot of different areas. We got allied health, nursing, patients, researchers, uh, we had indigenous leads, we had our primary care providers, we had people who were uh, leadership positions throughout the system, we had patient and families, all came together to try to come up with some guidance uh, for the system so that we would know how can we deliver virtual care in the best way possible. And this is the guidance document that we came out with. It was called, it's a clinical guidance for person-centered virtual care. And it's a scope of recommendations that we laid out about how we can best deliver virtual care, looking at things like selecting appropriate patients for virtual care, how do we deliver diagnosis, how do you get treat, how do you execute a treatment plan virtually? So if someone's coming in for treatment, how, where do you integrate virtual care in there? And what about follow-up appointments for those people? How do you integrate virtual care into that? And we looked at both telephone and video-based care because to be quite honest and frank, at the beginning, most of our virtual care was over the telephone, telehealth, uh, because we didn't have the infrastructure set up yet to be doing a lot of face-to-face -face video conferencing, which I think most of us has recognized is if possible, is probably superior. It's always good to see somebody in the communication. Uh, there's a lot of non-verbal communication that's an important part of any conversation let alone a conversation uh, in partnership between patients and their providers. So we did a lot of uh, research looking at this. We developed a panel and we come up with 62 recommendations uh, during this time period that we thought would drive the virtual care change going on in the Ontario cancer system. These recommendations were guided according to some of the basic principles of person-centered cancer care. And these involve topics such as knowing the patient as an individual, 
So when we looked at the virtual care framework, we have to say, well, if we're going to continue to think of our patients as people and not as numbers or statistics, we need to make sure that virtual care provides positive patient provider interactions. We had to think about what are those essential requirements of care? So we had to think about things, as I mentioned, about how do we get informed consent? How do we make sure that we're consenting our patients and making sure they understand their choices virtually? How do we confirm the patient's identity, which people would do at a registration desk and we never gave two thoughts about? But now we have to think about virtually, how do we make sure that we can confirm who people are, who they say they are, and we're maintaining privacy? How do we tailor healthcare services for each patient. So how do we make sure that when we're delivering virtual care, it's feasible and it's appropriate? Continuity of care and relationships. So when we're delivering virtual care, we had to think about care isn't one person, it's about a team. Cancer is a team sport. And, and you can see in Dr. Law's background, he has a big sign there saying teamwork, I totally agree. So how do we integrate these teams into virtual care? How do we maintain the documentation that's needed? How do we not let our standards drop? Uh, during this time period. And then we want to make sure that patients are partners in their care. We want to actually allow people to enable to participate in their care as best suits them. So do they have the tools and resources virtually? Uh, people may come in uh, to clinic and they may come into our education pod and you know there's a vast variety of materials and people to support. How do we transition to that uh, virtually? And I think Tamara is going to talk a little bit about that. And one of maybe the big advantages of virtual care is we wanted to make sure that we could involve caregivers and support people. So people who are supportive in your team of care, we want to make sure they're engaged. And one of the advantages of virtual care was that people didn't have to be in the same physical space. And that was a, a, a probably one of the positive things about virtual care. When we looked at how we were to want to do virtual care, we recognized cancer is a lot, is there's many different parts of cancer care. You can start at prevention and screening, but we really concentrated on both the diagnosis and the treatment of cancer, as well as the recovery period, the survivorship period. Not saying that these other areas are important, but for these recommendations, we wanted people who are sort of on active treatment or provide guidance because they had specific needs that would need to be met. So we came up with three sets of guide of areas. One is the essential requirements. So what are those things that are needed to make sure we provide good virtual care? The second was diagnosis and prognosis. What are those ways, what are the steps that we can take to ensure that if we're talking about a diagnosis or we're talking about prognosis and we have to do it virtually due to the pandemic, that we can do it in the most person-centered, compassionate, team-based way that we can. And then for those patients who are undergoing cancer care or have undergone and are in the survivorship phase, how do we bring in all these different components? How do we talk about the next step out of the cancer journey um, when you are uh, maybe completed your treatment or just in the midst of your treatment? How do we do that virtually? So when we look at essential requirements, we thought about um, you know, who should be consulted when you're providing virtual care? What are those basic things that are required? As I mentioned for diagnosis and prognosis, this was really about what is the best way to communicate a diagnosis how can we order tests for the diagnosis be done? And when should they not be done virtually? I think that was very important. And what aspects, if, if decisions are being made, if we had a limited capacity, because remember we had social distancing at that time, if we have a limited capacity, what are those aspects that we should be considering about who might be appropriate for virtual care or not? Now, we don't have those capacity limits to the same degree anymore, but the nice thing about this, this work is that it's enabled us to sort of think about the future post-COVID, about when we're able to look forward into how we can apply these principles to provide good virtual care. The final area, as I mentioned, was about active management or survivorship. And here we wanted to talk about who is suitable for virtual care. There are certain areas of cancer that were just not suitable. Physical exams needed to be done. And there were certain areas that we could provide virtual care and it was better for the patient and it was better for the system. And it worked for everybody. It was a win-win situation. So we were trying to find through these guidances and these win-win situations. So I'm not gonna go over, of course, all these recommendations, but I just thought it's important to be aware that these principles were considered at a provincial level when we were trying very rapidly to come out with recommendations on virtual care. Things to, in, to, to consider that these are just examples were that one of the recommendations talked about incorporating care partners. We wanted to make sure, we know that support team for patients is so important. We know that cancer is, is isn't about just a patient, it's about everybody around them and the support team around them. And we wanted to make sure 
that we maintain privacy, we maintain consent, but at the same time, we ensure that those people were still involved. Uh, at times, we had capacity limits where people weren't able to bring their care providers with them into the hospital, and that was really difficult for everybody. No one liked that. So with virtual care, we wanted to make sure we had figured out ways to incorporate care partners, even if they happened to be in another city, another country. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure they were involved in the discussion. We wanted to involve primary care. You know, I think people recognize that primary care physicians and primary care providers are incredibly important. And they're an important part of the support, but also the care journey for cancer patients, both during their cancer treatment, but also afterwards. And, and we've always been working on this in person or not in person, but virtually this became difficult. How do we involve primary care providers? So we um, came up with some options for a, a providing optimal patient care and even had instances where we had the primary care provider join in on that virtual appointment, which would have been impossible. Uh, in previous days to have a family doctor and an oncologist join together and communicate a plan back and forth in real time. And then training. And then we started to start talk about developing training programs for people, for providers, for nurses, doctors, for all providers to make sure that they're comfortable in having these difficult conversations that cancer care entails virtually. And we wanted, we decided we need to hear from the patients. That was one thing we were really missing. And we had, a, we have a patient experience measurement tool in Ontario for in-person care called Your Voice Matters. So within weeks, we quickly flipped this to a virtual platform. We wanted to under make sure that we were understanding the experience of patients who are having virtual care so we can move fast and make the changes that we needed to fast. And this involved uh, really um, aggressively making sure that all people who had virtual care appointments, that we tried to have some sort of platform for them to provide feedback. And there was other issues that we had to start to think about in virtual care. Uh, did you get a choice if you wanted virtual care or not? Were the instructions clear on how to join this virtual care appointment? What were your wait times like in virtual care? And, and did you have access or connectivity issues? These are all issues that we don't think about in person, but we had to start to think about uh, with virtual care, including language and how language might be a barrier for some people to provide virtual care. So a lot happened during then. Uh, we've come out of the pandemic um, and we're, we're, our cancer system has been transformed, no doubt about it. And I brought this slide up just to, to make sure people are aware. We now have an ongoing framework. It's changed somewhat, but we do have an ongoing framework now for permanent virtual care in the cancer system. We have an opportunity to see patients. We encourage people to be seen face-to-face -face on video if possible. There is an opportunity for phone, but we wanna make sure that people are still getting the care they need. And so the government, for example, has put in rules to say, that you know, after 24 months, you need to make sure you're seeing your patients in person as well. And so there is a framework, it's not perfect, but it's certainly a step in the right direction to make sure that we can provide virtual care ongoing and that we can have some of these advantages I described for virtual care for our cancer patients. And with that, I'll stop. And uh, you're gonna hear a lot more today about how these different recommendations and ideas got put into practice here at Sunnybrook. That's uh that's awesome, Simran. It's uh, fantastic, and uh, just uh, very glad to start receiving questions from the audience. We're going to answer them at the end, but uh, we're we've got your questions, and we're going to continue going. Again, Simran, thank you. So I'd like to introduce our next two speakers now. Um, first off, uh, Ruby Boa. She's a radiation therapist by training, but currently uh, she is our project manager of strategic initiatives at the Odette Cancer Center. Uh, Ruby has completed her master's of uh, health Sciences and Health Administration is a certified health executive. Um, translation, she's an awesome leader in our program. Her portfolio is inclusive of the Radiation Oncology Continuing Education Program, where she spearheads the development and implement implementation and evaluation of continuing education offerings, uh, virtual care within the ambulatory oncology program, and oper operationalizing new models of care and project leadership on external partnerships. So you can see Ruby has a huge wide base of knowledge in quality improvement and patient experience. And, uh, and I'm really glad that she's here to share some of her expertise this evening. Along with her is Angela Leahy. Um, Angela, uh, she's been an oncology nurse here for 30 years and she's just an incredible person. Uh, one of my favorite people here and uh, a, a wonderful colleague to work with. She currently holds the position as our patient care manager at the Odette Cancer Center, and she oversees the outpatient clinics and oncology nursing, and of course, virtual care as well. With the um, ongoing capacity and resource challenges and human healthcare 
challenges. Angela has been particularly excited to be part of the Virtual Care Initiative to help us. Um, we're very, very glad to have Angela and Ruby here tonight. Um, this evening, they're going to really talk about how the pandemic affected virtual care and give you an idea of how the Odette Cancer Center has uh, come through that and what they're going to plan to do. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone over to you both. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you, Calvin. Um, can everyone see my slides? Okay. Are my slides up? Yes, they are. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thanks, everyone, and, and a, a special thank you to Dr. Singh as well for kicking off the talk. I think what Ruby and I are going to touch on today is, is a, a really concrete example of how we've rolled out virtual care at the Odette Cancer Center. And really, you'll see embedded in our example uh, a lot of the key principles that came out at the provincial level, we have taken into consideration, and you'll see that peppered throughout our, our talk um, our talk this evening. So I'm just going to start by advancing the slides. Sorry, one second. Uh, I'm trying to advance with my keyboard. You might have to use the mouse when you're on Zoom. But... And where am I doing that? I'm sorry, everyone. Got it. My apologies. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to um, just the pandemic obviously changed everything in our lives, including healthcare. And I know certainly um, with all the restrictions that were put in place within the hospital and the Odette Cancer Center, we really had to pivot very quickly to think about how we were going to see our patients in a different way. Certainly uh, with fewer and fewer people being allowed into the hospital and into the cancer center, certainly back in early 2020, even a, a lot of the physicians were not able to come in as well. And um, so I think as Dr. Singh mentioned, a lot of the conversations that were happening between providers, healthcare providers and their patients was really over the phone. What we wanted to do though is um, certainly try to augment that and, and move toward the Zoom platform, which we heard earlier at, um, that not many of us knew about and knew what that looked like. But and it was really over a period of, of about a year and a half that we were able to really fine tune this process. One thing I wanted to share with people um, with regards to virtual care, sometimes it's a bit confusing and certainly in the context of Odette, we define virtual as being either by phone or by video. Um, one thing that we also realize is that you might have just one interaction by video or phone over the course of your healthcare pathway or you might have multiple visits that are done virtually. We know that um, with the introduction of Zoom, we were catapulted into um, trying to think how to best interact with the patients and the families. And the video platform certainly provided a much more comprehensive way of looking after our patients. Certainly, tomorrow we'll talk about the education component, but even we've gotten creative with how we have been seeing patients um, with also physicians and their fellows and learners that also want to um, look after patients and talk about different patient cases, we've been able to do that virtually as well. So one of the things that came out about virtual care is we didn't actually realize just the benefits that we would uh, see as a result of, of moving in this direction and moving to the video platform. We certainly know that people having the flexibility to either be in person or to do it virtually became very important. I see some questions in the chat we'll address later just around if you are committed to virtual, can you request in person and vice versa. Um, one of the things we didn't 
um, think about entirely off the off the bat, but certainly patients let us know is because a lot of our patients are beyond the GTA, not having to travel in uh, certainly helped and certainly helped through the winter months as well. And then not to mention the cost of parking. Sometimes people coming for just short visits just to get uh, a quick update on, on imaging or results maybe did not need to be done in person, but could have been done virtually. And that certainly uh, was helpful for people who didn't have to pay for the for the parking. One of the things we certainly noticed um, during the pandemic, but I would even say pre-pandemic, there were times that family members wanted to attend and friends tend with the patient. And it was difficult because they were at work, they couldn't get away, they couldn't make it to the cancer center, they weren't sure how long they'd be waiting. And this is one thing that virtual video has certainly been able to do is allow us to include the family members in with the appointments as well. Last but not least, I'm, it's not here, but um, I think a lot of people can find coming to the cancer center very anxiety provoking and having the ability to be in the comfort of their own home during their visit with their notepad and their questions uh, or someone to be there to take notes for them was certainly very helpful as well. So we mentioned the challenge with, with the pandemic, obviously, and certainly now we are seeing much higher volumes of people coming back into the center. That's a good thing, but also we have limited space and time um, to see people. And I think what we're most, uh, most thankful for is the um, ability to have hired some virtual clinic coordinators or virtual care coordinators. We've been able to hire four individuals that are working with us now to get our healthcare providers onto um, the option of running virtual clinics. It doesn't mean their entire practice or their entire patient care is done virtually, but to give them the option to do a half day clinic, a full day clinic where they can run that virtually. Uh, what we've done though, and we wanted to stick to is the same principle of how we flow our clinics in person, we wanted to create virtually as well. So there was a familiarity around being welcomed into the clinic, being welcomed into the Zoom, and then having the opportunity to go into a virtual room, which Ruby's going to touch on a little bit later, and then your uh, provider can come in and meet with you then. So where we're at today is we have 45 live clinics running on the Zoom platform. That's between 31 healthcare providers. I don't say doctors because they're not all physicians that are running these clinics. We have some genetic counselors as well. So with no further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to my colleague, Ruby. Thanks, Angela. Perfect. I'm just going to share my screen here. Sorry. Yeah. Perfect. So I'm going to walk us through what a virtual appointment actually looks like at our center. So for your virtual appointment, you will always be notified with an email. The email will be sent to you as soon as your appointment is booked, and a reminder is also sent to you 72 hours prior to your appointment. If you don't have an email address, you can always sign up for a free account or use a family members, friends, or caregivers, or someone that you trust instead. The email itself contains the details of your appointment, such as the date, time, and the Zoom link to join, as well as several options to join the virtual clinic, which can include joining by the computer, through your phone, or by audio only using your home phone. Our virtual coordinators will also call you 48 hours prior to your appointment to ensure that you have received the Zoom link. And they will also check in with you to ensure that you're able to access the appointment. If at that time you're unfamiliar with Zoom, our virtual coordinators are more than happy to walk you through the steps on how to join the virtual clinic. So there are a few things to keep in mind when you're preparing for your appointment. You wanna ensure that you're checking your email regularly to see if there's any updates from your healthcare team. If you have a family member or caregiver that's also gonna be joining your appointment, you wanna ensure that they know the date and time and have the Zoom link as well. You wanna ensure that you're available 15 minutes before and after your appointment as sometimes our providers can run late. And you wanna to try to find a private, quiet, well-lit area for your visit. 
On the day of your appointment, you want to open the email and click on the link or use the meeting details to access your appointment. Once you've done that, you will be directed to our virtual waiting room, which is very similar to our patient waiting areas at the center. You'll see a message that says your virtual coordinator will admit you shortly and to have your personal details ready. Once you've been admitted to the clinic, you will be greeted by one of our virtual coordinators. They will confirm your identity, connect you with any family members or caregivers that are also joining the appointment, and troubleshoot any audio or video challenges you may be having with Zoom. Once you feel ready, the virtual coordinator will then move you to a clinic room, which is also known as a Zoom breakout room. The breakout room or clinic room is where you connect with your provider. So in the clinic room, you may see some familiar faces. So you may have your family members or caregivers in the clinic room. If an interpreter is needed, you may see an interpreter as well. And, if, and since we are a teaching hospital, you may also see learners that are working with the providers. This is very similar to all of the people you will see during your in-person visit as well. Once the interaction in the clinic room is done, you are free to leave the meeting. About a month after your appointment, we, you will receive a link from our team to share your experience. This helps us make continual improvements and ensure a seamless experience for your virtual care appointment. So to date, we have been able to connect with some of our patients. Uh, so these results here are um, about 142 patients that we've heard from. And what they've shared with us is that they felt very prepared for the Zoom appointment. They felt that the email had clear instructions they did not experience very many technical difficulties and overall were very satisfied with their visit. I did have the opportunity to speak with a patient recently. Uh, this was a woman who is a new mom and she shared with us that she was very relieved to do her appointment over lunch as she lives in Ajax. She said, virtual is super convenient. I received a lot of reminder calls and now I have peace of mind knowing the next steps of my care. It was really wonderful to see. So we touched on this a little bit already, with Dr. Singh and with Angela. So there are many benefits to virtual care. You know, it can be accessed using many devices, your phone, your computer or tablet. It's very easy to add family members or caregivers. They don't have to be in the same location or even in the same country. There's no need to travel to the hospital or worry about parking and you can have your appointment from the comfort of your own home. Ruby, you can just leave the slides up. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm going to pass you. it over to Angela to walk us through some commonly asked questions. Yeah, just a few key things because we figured that members of the audience who've uh, not yet had a virtual appointment, regardless of where that might be, might have some, some questions around this. Um, certainly in getting prepared for the virtual visit, what can throw people off is that you're, you're all set up and you've worried about the tech piece, but you've forgotten key things like getting glasses and hearing aids. Um, being prepared to show if you've got a wound or rash or something that you want to share, making sure that there's privacy in your space to be able to do that, having a pen and paper ready, and obviously a medication list and some of the things that you need close at hand uh, to go over with regards to what you might need for that appointment. Things that you might rifle through your bag when you're actually in an in-person appointment. Next slide, Ruby. Um, one of the key questions we get asked is what if you don't have access to a computer or a webcam? Um, where possible, we find a lot of the family members are jumping in to say, I'll get that set up for you, and they're helping out that way. And certainly if a computer is not available, even off the Zoom platform, we can generate a call out to you. So we may not see you video-wise or, or um, visually, but that's okay. We can still have you on the platform and be talking to you. Um, question about not having ever used Zoom before and what do I do? The appointment email has a step by step by step, but also our virtual coordinators will call you in advance, make sure that you feel comfortable to getting connected to Zoom, and then in the moment they can help you troubleshoot and provide assistance. Just a couple more things. Um, this, this comes up a lot. What if English is, is my second language? And as Ruby mentioned, we have interpreter services available that are quite smooth and seamless and certainly have helped support the visit if family members have not uh, come into the visit to try and help with that. And I think last but not least, safety and privacy. That's one of the number one concerns. Uh, because we're generating 
um, a lot of the uh, Zoom out of the uh, secure server at the hospital. Certainly on our end, we can keep things private, but similar to any in-person in visit that you might have, we do our best um, to keep that uh, keep it private and secure uh, as we would in the clinic as much as possible as well. But certainly on Zoom, we can we can certainly facilitate that even more so. And I think that's it. Thanks, Ruby. I think we'll hand it back to Dr. Law. That's awesome, guys. Thank you uh, so much. And uh, questions are still pouring in, which is uh, fantastic. And now I'm going to uh, take up the next little part and uh, go to my talk, which I'm gonna share with you right now. So what, I'm, what I'd like to do tonight is maybe take us uh, right down to the front line from my point of view, which is uh, how, do I, uh, how do I make virtual care work um, given that I'm a surgeon? So I'm, I'm not gonna talk about how uh, I robotically operate on you in your own bed at home. That's not my version of virtual care. Uh, instead, uh, it is how you fit what Ruby and Angela just showed us, what Simran talked about as a network, how does it fit now inside a uh, cancer surgeon's uh, practice? So here we go. Now, the um, what I'd like to go tonight is I'm gonna give you a little bit of background because this background is important to see how things fit. Now, we, uh, me especially, is a, a, a liver and pancreas surgeon, so it's very specialized. And what I want to talk to you about is to introduce to you, at least the, those of you who may not know, what regionalized complex cancer surgery is in Ontario. Uh, we're also going to talk about a concept called a shared imaging repository, because that definitely affects how this care is delivered. Then I want to go over with you what a typical journey might look like to get to a complex cancer surgery and why virtual care actually fits in there really well. And then finally, I'm actually kind of excited to show you a pilot study we did right before lockdown. So this was based on a lot of the pilot work as someone uh, told you earlier, he and I have been involved in, in um, uh, learning about virtual care and piloting it for, for some time now. And I will say the pandemic put like basically rocket fuel into the engine. But before then, uh, we were already starting, and I wanted to give you that context to show you what patients were saying, you know, outside of just COVID. What was virtual care, not just with COVID? So let's dig into that. I think it's pretty cool. This is a historical document from 1925. So we're not brand new in this. That Somebody had already imagined virtual care. Well, in this case, it even included a virtual like robot that you could check a patient. But the idea of being in a remote location is certainly something people have been dreaming about. And I feel like we're closer to this ideal than ever before. Now in Ontario, to set this up was the development of what we call uh, centers of excellence for certain complex procedures. Listen, if you're in Ontario, you're gonna get great cancer care. There are many cancer centers, but there are some surgeries that are very complicated. Liver and pancreas surgery is a high risk, high intensity surgery. And these are actually only done in 10 places in Ontario. And these are the ones highlighted in orange, uh, as far north as Sudbury and as uh, far uh, south as uh, Kitchener and London, Ontario. And really this was designed uh, to concentrate teams, not just surgeons, but teams. And that includes the intensive care unit, the post-operative recovery nurses, the ward nurses, cancer center, uh, the medical oncologists that work with the cancer surgeons to, to give either therapy before or after cancer surgery. And it was very, very clear that patient outcomes were far better in these concentrated centers than when we just did a little bit in many, many hospitals. And this is something Ontario can be very proud of leading in the world as they clearly demonstrated an improvement in surgical outcomes because of this. The trick, of course, is look at where the orange dots is. The, the travel that's required is starting to become uh, obvious. The distance you are from these centers uh, is, is very obvious on the map. And although a lot of the population is concentrated in the uh, southern part of Ontario, um, and that's where most of the orange dots are, it's still, that's a huge number of kilometers even in that area. But Ontario has really pushed toward this. And before this time, if you needed, the surgery, you would be traveling back and forth, getting ready for the surgery, uh, and ultimately the surgery being done. Now, that's not even changed now. 
What's changed is I think we've made the journey a little bit easier and that's coming up. The second thing that's helped is what we call a shared imaging repository. This is something else we, that we've been working on a long time. Um, something that really in the background, the whole idea of it was that in the past, information was kind of sent one to the other. Did you bring your chart? Did you bring your disk? I still remember the old, uh, the old days, it was like a miracle that you could bring uh, imaging on a CD because before you had to bring a huge bag of, of images. Now, me just saying that makes me, uh, already dates me. But the fact is um, things were, you had to bring the data with you. And that just didn't make any sense anymore in the fee, especially in the world of this kind of distributed care. And this really led to uh, a real question of how do we do it? And the key was we needed a unifier and an imaging repository holds all the pictures, all the labs, all the data, uh, we're, specifically imaging was what we were looking at in one place so that you can through this server connect anywhere and there's no disk to bring, there's no worry about uh, whether or not somebody can see your scan. It's just completely seamless because the system is connected. And it was a really uh, huge moment when this was done. Interestingly, we at Sunnybrook lived right on the border of, um, of an area where we served to the east of Young Street, where at one point in our history, everybody was connected on this imaging repository and everybody to the west of Young Street was not connected. Now, this wasn't a Sunnybrook choice. This is one of those incredibly uh, interesting decisions made by uh, politicians. But whatever the case is, before I get into that, it gave us a natural opportunity to look at patients served from one side or the other, one having a natural kind of split between those on an imaging repository and those not. And to one of the interesting surprises that was published out of this study was that those who were on the imaging repository, that is their care team, no matter what hospital they're at, were on an integrated information system, they got to surgery faster, uh, their wait times were slower, and I can tell you their outcomes were still the same. So nobody got rushed to surgery. Uh, just because you didn't have your scan necessarily done at Sunnybrook didn't mean that you had a worse outcome at surgery. It was amazing. There was in new efficiencies, and really inside this shared system, you probably saved at least one scan for every five patients that came in. And when you look at the total volumes and the number of people who live in Ontario, the volume is huge. And that was so important. But little did we know, this all connects between having regional centers, making people further, a little bit further away from specialized care, but then bringing that closer together by having joint imaging repositories led us to better understand how it fit here. This is a very, very brief look at what your journey might look like for complex cancer surgery. It's a lot easier if you just need a hernia fixed or you have a bad gallbladder. Those are very straightforward. It's one decision only and then the surgery. But a lot of times people start with a question or suspicion of cancer. Then uh, they have to get some tests. They're just like very, very general tests just to find out if there's anything there. Sometimes they find a non-specific lump. They still don't know what it is. And then you have to go back for confirmatory studies to, to look at an area because a lot of times general study just told you where to look. Now you have to look at that area more carefully. Then you say, oh my goodness, there might be a tumor there. Then you gotta go and make sure the whole body is staged with whatever specific staging scan you might need. Um, that, and also that is important for planning all your options for treatment. For us, it means that your care is brought to a multidisciplinary team, whether or not you meet them all, your case will be presented to everybody. And then it comes back to you um, where we talk about the non-surgical options and the surgical options. Then you go on to planning if you need any preoperative treatments. Sometimes people get chemo before. Sometimes people get special medications before. Sometimes people need some special treatments um, uh, before they get to a complex surgery. And then there's all the planning. What do you need to get ready? And then ultimately you, you get to surgery. It is not so straightforward of a road and a lot of people don't know this. And instead, what they did was, you know, came traveling many, many kilometers to Sunnybrook multiple times in this journey just to get here. And that was okay. At that time, that was the price you paid for better outcomes, for having, uh, for having uh, more successful surgery, for having less complications after surgery going to this. We, we, we all accepted as a public that that's what we'd have to do to, to get this kind of specialized, complex, better care. But 
the whole virtual gave us an opportunity to do something new. A lot of these stages, this whole beginning stage, you could do that virtually. You, you know, you'll see that a lot of times you come in and you speak to your surgeon and uh, or your other provider, and it's a lot of talking and exploring. And yeah, sometimes there's always the gentle, you know, touch on the shoulder or whatever you need, but a lot of it was a conversation. And what we had found was when we, when in, in our pilot, in our surgical work, we don't like phone as we try to avoid it as much as we can, because we think that seeing you has not only human communication value, there's actually medical assessment value. There's a lot of things that we can tell just looking at you, but having that ability means that this first stage all the way to the point where we multidisciplinary discussion happens can be done virtually with you. Even the surgical options and discussion can be done virtually. And when you get to planning, that's a great time for us to now meet together. And then when you meet us for the first time, it's not so strange, it, it, even though it's the first time in person, we already feel like we know each other. Hopefully we've established some rapport and some trust. We kind of get to know each other's personality and then you can have the physical exam. But you just saved yourself a whole lot of trips while still getting the same value of care, the same human interaction. But the engine driving this possibility was because we also had the imaging repository. So here I am talking to you from far away on Zoom, but I can see your scan. That was done at your local hospital, but I can see it right here on my computer. Similarly, um, all this work with regionalized care, well, the ability to integrate virtual just made something that separated Ontarians a lot, just made it a little bit smaller, a little bit less um, bothersome, a little less uh, uh, intensive for traveling, and it just made regionalized care with all its advantages, even a little bit more advantageous. So we looked at, when we were starting this, and this was right before uh, the, the pandemic was called, we started look, doing the six month pilot because we wanted to know if we integrated, fully integrated a video virtual practice into very complex hepatobiliary uh, cancer surgery, what would happen? And what, really what happened was we, uh, two of us out of the four <laughs> surgeons uh, started to look at, number one, we were gonna use a new system that could connect to any personal device. Now this wasn't Zoom, this was still on the old OTM, but it was like Zoom, which is that you could use a phone or a knife, a tablet or something. It was the first time because there was a time where you had to go to an actual telemedicine center. And a lot of those times it was one of those hidden doors in the malls that you never go into. But it was actually like a lot of small cities had these and you have to drive to the mall and do it and use their own video system. But, we're, but with the advent of technology and smartphones and tablets and everything else, this was our first pilot right before we went into Zoom, but with the functionality uh, a, a little bit more primitive, but with the similar uh, functionality of Zoom. This was for really either follow-up or new consults. We used it off hours because this gave us an extra time where we didn't need to use clinic space to do it. We were looking and monitoring some usage statistics. And more importantly, we set up a series of interviews to try and understand uh, what people were experiencing and getting to know maybe which way we should go or how this could influence practice. And out of that, we in that six months, there was 112 people that participated in this that 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 made up 230 visits. And it was about, you know, 60, uh, there was almost 50-50 uh, male, female. So it was pretty um, uh, well uh, distributed. But what was really important was this wasn't a young person pilot. The coolest part was we had a 91 year old who said, well, it's not that hard to connect. And uh, the median age was actually 61. There was a whole distribution of different cancers, but there was also a 60, 40 split between whether you had a localized cancer or you had a more um, complex cancer that had spread to other organs, those can still have operations, but they're more complex. So it really included a lot of these different uh, scenarios. Um, out of those 230 visits, uh, some of the patients, the average number of the patients had two visits. Some had one visit that was virtual. Some had 13 visits that were virtual prior to this. Each of the appointments we had set in this pilot for 30 minutes so that there was plenty of time to do the connection, to figure it all out. Uh, the, the doctors could be a little late, but they would usually be in there within 30 minutes. So it was really defined uh, 30 minutes, which we thought was a big improvement from the usual calling Rogers Cable, and they'll be at your house somewhere between 9 a.m. to uh, 12 p.m. the next day or something crazy like that. 
The amazing thing was our patients were an average about 47, 47 kilometers away. But what was really incredible is some of the people that did want to enroll in the pilot were only 1.1 kilometer away from Sunnybrook. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Our record center was 1,851 kilometers away from Sunnybrook. The driving time was uh, uh, using a, uh, uh, we actually had people's um, address, we took their appointment time, we took, uh, the Google Maps can actually do research on how long it takes you to drive at the time of your appointment, but the, uh, the measurement for the driving time was about 35 minutes, but the driving time could have been even as long as uh, 1,171 minutes um, as well. Now, when, then we, after doing this, pretty extensive pilot with a very wide range of, uh, of these scenarios, we went out and wanted to find out how people were doing. We both had a fairly open uh, interview. These are like qualitative research, but basically it was a little bit open-ended to try and throw, try to glean out some themes that people said. And the four main themes people did talk about was that they felt they got quality clinical care. They thought that their care was actually fairly efficient. There was, technology was very prominent. There was good and bad of that. And then the final theme was they thought that it felt like the future, which I thought was quite interesting. In terms of uh, quality of clinical care, the big things people talked about was that they felt there was a big synergy with in-person care. And people really felt better when they realized that we used virtual care to supplement our in-person care. Um, you had both and they worked really well. They helped limit, gave you lots of time to discuss in times you didn't have to be in-person, but it worked, it seamlessly fit into your in-person appointments. Um, th there was some equity with this that people really liked it. It really allowed people of any kind of ability or disability, age or, or, or distance, they all had much more equal access to complex cancer surgery. As you can imagine, if you live in Leaside right beside Sunnybrook, it's a lot easier in the old days to get here than if you lived in Timmins and you needed to come here to Sunnybrook. Well, this was a bit of a game changer because for the early part, for a vast majority of the planning and of the care, all of a sudden, you almost had the same advantage as living in Leaside. Uh, the final thing was that there was great participation from family. Uh, the whole idea of being able to do it in the evenings, be able to do it in um, uh, more flexibly by video, the ability to have multiple lines connect at the same time meant that a lot of more family members were able to join uh, in these appointments than what you might get for a 2.30 appointment uh, where you wait an hour in the waiting room. The other theme was this thing about efficiency. They, th th there was this very much happiness that in those 30 minutes, somebody came in. Uh, in person, so the problem with in person that we still have now is that people show up. Sometimes our cancer center is a little bit of a, like an emergency room, urgent patients just come in. Sometimes the wait is longer than you think. But in this pilot, you were seen in your 30 minute window. Um, the, um, the, the other thing in terms of efficiency that might not be so good from the provider side was that, well, you couldn't really book three people at two o'clock anymore, uh, just to get all the patients in at the same time. But that was actually good for patients, even though it might not have allowed you to see as many uh, patients during the day. But the flip side of this is we were doing it through extended hours on this pilot. So it kind of did balance out. The other thing was about technology, and I already talked about this, that it was really clear from provider interviews that it couldn't have worked without the uh, underlying technology for a common imaging repository and also for connected health records, which the uh, physicians here use something called Connecting Ontario. Uh, they did say Connecting Ontario sometimes weren't connected to private uh, primary care offices or patients that were off of a hospital system, but it was really important that what drove the ability to succeed here was the ability to have that other technology. Uh, it was interesting that, uh, you know, other technology issues that people came up with was, you know, broadband speed was sometimes not as fast as you think. Sometimes even in the Toronto area, uh, wow, when you get your bargain uh, deal from Rogers, uh, boy, that bargain deal was sometimes really slow. And I will say it's gotten a lot faster over the last little while. Um, but, uh, but, you know, when the time of this study, there was still a lot of people on very slow internet, if I could say it that way. There were some glitches with personal devices. I think I'm going to show you one in a second, but, you know, uh, audio connection. Sometimes somebody was on speakerphone or headphone. They couldn't tell. So it was hard to hear. Um, you know, it's interesting to have a virtual appointment where you're looking in somebody's ear for most of the time because they had to put their smartphone on their ear. So those were some things that we had to, to get over for the clinician side. 
It did help with dual monitors so they could see the patient on one and then they could uh, look at their test results on the other. So doctors who only had one screen had to learn how to use two screens. So there were some adjustments that were made. My favorite was uh, a wonderful patient of mine. And again, we did see each other in person, but for one of our discussions, um, I had to have the discussion with her cat because they just couldn't get the camera to flip back the other way. And the cat was incredibly patient with me as I went through a complex liver surgery. The final thing was the feeling about that this is the future. And, and really, I think people started to understand that they could get a lot of the complex discussions, a lot of the learning what I'm going through, a lot of the presentation of different options uh, that actually uh, happen on a virtual uh, uh, setting. The other thing was they, they felt that our connection to their local oncologists or their local care teams were a lot better because they didn't leave anywhere, they didn't go anywhere, but we were there with them right in their own community. And they, it just gave them that feeling that we were connected with them, which was really important to also establish like a local uh, feel to the care. And that actually, again, I've already said it before, but there was some feeling from smaller communities that they felt that finally they felt they had some access to uh, complex cancer surgeries, but they always had this access. But this just removed some of the barriers that made it a little different than if you lived a kilometer away from Sunnybrook versus a thousand kilometers from Sunnybrook. And certainly the feedback we got was it felt like the future. So I think one of my patients sent me this saying, thank you. This was an amazing, amazing uh, 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 treatment that we gave to somebody who lived in Kenora, which is closer to Winnipeg than it is to Thunder Bay even, forget Toronto. And um, very rare disease, very hard to figure out. And uh, we were able to offer a whole complex host of surgery from heart surgery to abdominal surgery to everything. And all of it from uh, one, like 1900 kilometers away. It would have taken 19 hours to drive back and forth, but with virtual, we got so many things done before the eventual flight to Toronto and the treatments that, that, that was needed. So for us, this allows us to give that care almost anywhere in Ontario. So I guess back to the question, can surgical care be delivered virtually? I hope I've convinced you, yes. I hope I've shown you how, and I hope I've shown you how the underlying technology that has driven and has improved in Ontario is actually allowing us the ability to offer really good virtual care. I think that, uh, that it's really important that anyone with any device can do it. Uh, I think the only problem I've run into now, people think they can have their appointment while driving to the grocery. And I have to say, no, 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 no driving while talking. <laughs> and, um, but really the bottom line is the video is only a small part of it. Uh, those interconnected systems are important, but the video part is important because there's a whole human connection, which I hope we're having here tonight, actually on this virtual. Um, it, it really brings you that sense that really far exceeds any experience that you can get just over the phone. And I am just so pleased that it wasn't a simple kind of cancer surgery treatment we were offering over this virtual uh, care model, video virtual care model, but it was a complex thing. We can do it. We can integrate it. We, it's not just a novelty. It's actually helping people get better care. So that really gave us a lot of excitement of where this could go. And, um, and, and that was on the old system, this study. Now we're definitely moving to the new system, which I think is working better than ever. And something that you just saw uh, Ruby and Angela present a second ago. All right, thank you uh, for that. And uh, from then on, the another important part of, um, of care is actually patient education. So that's our next talk. Uh, before we get there again, reminder to everybody, please put your questions online uh, through the question site uh, on the web. I am absolutely delighted to introduce to you another dear friend of mine and another leader here in our cancer program from our heart. She's our cancer program manager of patient and family education and a strategic lead at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and, and uh, uh, in Ontario Health uh, for person-centered care. Uh, Tamara has extraordinary expertise in health literacy and has helped develop education modules in this area for both the University of Toronto, for Sunnybrook Health Sciences, and for Cancer Care Ontario. She is actually an adjunct lecturer in the Faculty of Dentistry at U of T. Uh, her research interest as well is always looking at how the patient could be an educator, how health literacy impacts their care, and uh, obviously the impact overall of the patient education experience 
on patient experience as a whole. Tamara, thank you again so much for being with us this evening. And here you are to present uh, virtual patient and family education tonight. So I'll hand that time over to you. Thanks, Calvin. So um, I'm going to take us a little bit out of the kind of realm of hearing about the clinical kind of aspect of the virtual care and bring us into um, what Simran uh, actually talked about and referred to earlier on, which was that person-centered guideline um, around enabling patients to actively participate in their care. And that's really what we talk about when we talk about uh, patient family education. I want to say that I feel really you know, privileged to be able to be uh, part of this patient and family education program. It's a very unique program that's situated in the cancer program uh, at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. And we're really fortunate that we have the ability to deliver this in, I think, a very different way than you may see it delivered across uh, the rest of the organization and um, a really important aspect of cancer care. So tonight, I really want to talk to you about um, our virtual approach. And it was interesting when Dr. Singh talked about the sort of hodgepodge that we walked into um, as the pandemic kind of struck us. We were not so standardized, I guess, in our approaches to virtual care. And the same applies in terms of virtual education. We did a little bit of it, but it wasn't really uh, evolved. And um, it was mostly sort of on our website. So the challenge... Um, that we were really presented with once the pandemic hit was how can we um, create virtual education that is really going to address the diverse needs of patients and families and deliver it at a very um, high level of quality and so that it's equitable. Um, and, um, you know, some of that uh, Dr. Law talked about, you know, that there's a lot of equity in delivering care virtually, but there's also some challenges in terms of technology. How do people access technology? You know, some of us are um, much more adept at that than others. And, and so we have to think about that when we're, we're, we're considering the creation of, of virtual education. And we really had to consider um, you know, the timing, as we always do, even when we have people come to us uh, physically, the accessibility, the patient and family experience, and what were people's learning preferences? Do people prefer print? Do they prefer something that is given uh, verbally by a clinician? Is it something that they'd rather watch as a video? All of these were taken into consideration as we started to kind of figure our way through this, uh, this part of uh, virtual education. So I just want to put up here kind of what we looked like pre-pandemic, because the pandemic, um, obviously, you've heard, really spurred us on uh, to create something that was a virtual uh, patient education model. So pre-pandemic, we have, um, if you've ever been here, we have this beautiful patient education center that sits as soon as you walk into the front doors, the north doors of the cancer center, um, you get access to this library of resources. We had Lots of volunteers that participated in running of the Pearl. We have patient buddies who walk throughout the cancer center and really um, do everything from take people to uh, their uh, appointments if they don't have someone with them, all the way through to introducing them to patient education resources and doing handoffs to our patient and family support team. Um, we had lots of community organizations that were physically um, uh, at the center providing sort of the other part of uh, cancer support and education. We had drop-in sessions with clinicians. We also were responsible for running the WIG program, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on as a success story in virtual care. And then we had this kind of public phone number where people could call in and ask us questions. We had all of our online resources, our website, our public email video. And then we did these in-person, um, very uh, topic specific lectures. And we did a lot of classes, in-person classes. So then the pandemic hit us and you could see that we have all of these sort of red pieces that happened. So closed on hold. And, you know, we really weren't able to deliver education in the way that we were used to because people were coming into the cancer center really just to get treatment in and out um, as uh, little exposure as possible to protect patients and families. And patients came in without their families much of the time. So for us, this impacted us in terms of just closing all of this stuff up. And it was significant. And we actually had a time where our team was 
fully mobilized into uh, screening people at the door. So we weren't even doing our core work. So you can see that then we moved to more of a hybrid strategy and, and I tried to put it up here so you can see sort of the evolution. In 2020, we put everything really very much on hold, but as time went on and we became uh, more used to this environment, we started to consider how we could make these offerings uh, in a you know meaningful, accessible way. And you can see that now 2023, most of it's in green with a couple of on holds. What I will say, and something that I'm really, really proud of, um, is that the clinical team and the patient education teams came together very, very quickly to make sure that we pivoted and we created education virtually. So pretty much all of our classes were um, uh, offered on Zoom within about three months of kind of the official pandemic being declared. And that was really something that was quite unique to um, the uh, Odette Cancer Program. And I think it served people very well. Um, when the Pearl Library closed, there was a lot of lessons that we learned that came out of this. We realized that you know, COVID protocol, protocols were pretty much going to probably be in place for some time for the foreseeable future. future. And so we you know, added a lot of pieces to that. So this isn't unique to virtual, but just to note that this did have an impact in terms of how we thought about the delivery of education. And we did notice one of the things was that patients wanted to spend less and less time sort of face-to-face -face with people. I think that's changing even now. There's a little bit more of a comfort level, but it meant that we were really forced into thinking about how we could deliver education in a more virtual way. Um, one of the success stories, stories that I did want to talk about, which was really unique, and I give full credit to somebody on my team that developed this, was we, um, as I said, patient and family education had oversight of our wig program, and this is a very popular program. There's a lot of people that require wigs after uh, cancer treatment or during cancer treatment. And um, we, uh, pre-pandemic, offered this in this sort of tiny little room where people would have to discover it, quite honestly. They'd have to be told about it. And there were volunteers that were on site to help people try on wigs and to loan them out. But it was very much dependent on somebody being there at the time, someone finding the space. And I would say that it wasn't the most efficient way of getting a wig. And um, when we had to close that down, we decided that a really great way to, to deliver this service and an important service to be delivered was to take all of our wigs, to photograph them, and then to create this online wig catalog with a service that went along with it. So people could actually go to the wig catalog through our website, pick out what they wanted, create the sort of order, so to speak. These are free wigs. And then we would arrange to meet people at uh, the entrance. Now people can actually come into the building in a much easier way, but we meet them, we drop them the wigs off, and then they take what they want. And we see that, uh, we saw actually that this was a huge improvement in terms of um, the service. So um, we saw that actually there was a 14% increase in people taking out uh, wigs via this online sort of service um, then in 2021. And so we will keep it um, uh, going in this particular way. And so that's just sort of an interesting piece around how virtual care can actually um, improve uh, pieces um, that we hadn't really, wouldn't have really thought about, I think, before the pandemic. And we were sort of forced into thinking about this very creatively, and it's ended up being a real success. Um, we also had um, uh, lectures and teaching that were offered, and of course, those were all put on hold as soon as um, we were told that we had to really limit uh, patient visits. And one of the things that was particularly popular uh, for the patient and family education team and a real had a real impact was um, something called the Wimberg Education Series and also our clinical education classes. And so we had to really think about how we're going to be delivering this. The, the lectures and the teaching, um, you can see in 2020, were in a transition period because we had to figure out what we were going to do. And then quite quickly, we transitioned all of these into virtual. So you can see that we have these public lecture series. We have Introduction to Chemotherapy, which is a standard of care class. All patients that are going to be put on chemotherapy are told that they really should be attending this class. 
Um, we had something called managing your lymphedema that went online exclusively. And then we even created some new classes. So um, what to expect for after skin surgery and what to expect after breast surgery. That was not so much a new class, but it had been delivered in person. And it actually, um, during COVID, we had to use this uh, method of delivering education um, as kind of almost a replacement for a visit. So the occupational therapist and the physiotherapist would typically speaking, go and see patients after their surgery and do some of the teaching then. And that really wasn't possible. So we quickly figured out how we we're going to do this in a virtual way. And so any surgical patient that was coming to get a breast surgery um, and required this teaching, we would identify them before they had the surgery and then provide all the teaching that they needed to take care of themselves post-operatively. And it was a really nice way of actually um, filling that gap. And um, that that um, has turned out to be a, a, a very a good success. And then um, we also found that, you know, we couldn't have, typically we would have patients um, be accompanied by family members to see what the radiation oncology part, the radiation part of their experience, if they were getting radiation therapy, what that would look like. And so because families weren't able to really come in for that part of the teaching, the radiation therapist created this walk with me. Um, uh, virtual series where people could actually see what was going to happen during a radiation therapy appointment, another um, uh, piece of work that was quite successful. One of the things that didn't work so well, and I do think it's really important to point out places where, you know, we weren't so successful was we had a lymphedema class. And again, any patient that is going to have a surgery where there's um, any type of uh, removal of lymph nodes or where they're um, going to be surgery around that area would um, be uh, somebody who might be at risk of developing lymphedema. And so we had this lymphedema clinic at Sunnybrook. And typically what would have happened is that you would have had um, a class giving all the education and followed by your lymphedema appointments. So we pair them up together so people could actually go into the clinic with the questions on hand and have a very basic understanding what lymphedema was. So during that clinic appointment, they could be really focused on doing what they needed to do in clinic. And um, because uh, we had to go virtual, we tried to do this um, through Zoom and we found that the attendance rate was really, really low, that people weren't necessarily seeing the connection between the class and the clinic. And so now we've decided that really the best um, uh, way forward is to actually offer the lymphedema class ahead of the clinic and to go back to what we were doing uh, pre-pandemic. So um, sort of interesting kind of how it, it works out and what it looks like depending on what the connection is to the actual physical visit. Um, another success story was us for us was the introduction to chemotherapy class. This is a standard of care class, as I had mentioned before. It covers topics like what to expect during chemotherapy, sort of what the logistics are, what it's going to look like on the day that you arrive for your chemotherapy appointment, where you need to go, how you need to check in. Um, but it also covers topics like symptom management and other frequently asked questions. And we transitioned this to Zoom. And then we took um, sort of the pieces of what would be very important around chemotherapy and we made them into these mini education modules that were available online. And that class was promoted on our website in print form and all new patients who are receiving chemotherapy are emailed with that Zoom link weekly. The class is taught out of the PEARL, so the clinician would uh, sign on to uh, Zoom through the PEARL and then we sort of jointly manage the enrollment into that class. Um, and you can see here that, you know, this really prompted us into thinking about, again, if we were doing a Zoom class, what were the other pieces that we needed to kind of integrate and focus on? And so we actually developed these chemotherapy 101 pieces, which kind of accompanied the class. And again, something that I'm not sure we would have been thinking of doing prior to. So really thinking about making that quality of education where it really should be. Um, and so now this is the way that it is delivered and will continue to be delivered. And that I think the part that's really um, uh, kind of nice about this is that patients don't need to come in for an extra appointment to come to an education class. They can all do it from you know, their um, uh, home or wherever they are at. It means they don't have to pay for an extra parking um, uh, a session and um, that they don't need to uh, travel here and back. 
So you can see that uh, what I wanted to sort of qualify here is that you can see that in uh, April, June 22, there was a 52% participation rate. Now, what I will say here is that that's very typical of what we would see when we offered the classes in um, uh, like an on-site physical environment. Um, so that I didn't change very much. Um, you know, we have to figure out why we're only getting 52% of people that are attending the class. But essentially, it stayed very much the same. And you can see that it's actually increasing from the uh, most recent data that we have. We also have done a lot of evaluation. So we did evaluation pre-virtual and post-virtual. And we see that everything is actually improving in terms of you know, people saying that they understood the information that was presented, that they actually feel comfortable managing side effects, that they're going to use the information, that they found the class useful. And then we asked about whether you would prefer a live class, and live class was positioned as a Zoom class, a live Zoom class versus a recorded version. And we see that there's a bit of a split here, 70 versus 29. And the beautiful part about this is, is that we can serve both those audiences, those people. So we have recorded classes. We have these mini modules on chemotherapy. And then we have the live class for people that want to kind of jump onto a Zoom class and be able to ask questions to whoever's delivering the class. And for this particular class, we have both pharmacists and chemotherapy nurses that deliver the class. So excellent expertise in this area. And then, you know, we have people um, talk about giving, um, did the class give them new information? And again, here, just to qualify that, I always think that sort of the measure is not necessarily giving new information. Sometimes it's really good to repeat information that somebody already received just to re sort of um, to emphasize some of the points that we really want to keep uh, front and center. So who to call when you have symptoms and side effects, how to call and what to look out for. Another um, uh, area where we do a lot of work is in these Wimberg Education Series. This is a donor-funded education series, very similar to what we're doing tonight. It's focused on cancer topics. And so we do everything from how to eat uh, during cancer treatment all the way through to very specific things like, you know, the latest research or treatment on prostate cancer or something on breast cancer. And we do a number of these throughout the year. And I will say that this has been a very big improvement uh, from um, both a cost perspective and also from, um, I think, a, an overall experience perspective. Patients, again, people don't need to drive in to actually hear the speakers. They can connect in through Zoom. The Zoom sessions have been very, very successful. Um, we also don't have to find space in uh, the hospital and pre-book this space. And so it becomes um, an easier way to deliver these sessions and we can do more of them. So this is really um, delivered through a team approach. We every single time have a patient present about their lived experience with cancer. So if you haven't attended one of these, I would highly encourage you to come to our uh, ODET Cancer Center website, look up patient education, and you'll find um, all of these events online. You can see here that um, uh, 2022, we did nine of these events. We had about 650 plus patients and families participate and seven what we call patient educators participate. So they share their lived experience. They talk about what were the things that they learned about that specific cancer diagnosis or treatment, what helped them. And um, it's really an excellent series. Um, just that to note here that we do do a lot of polls and evaluation and, um, you know, we found that, you know, a, a really high proportion, 88% found that their learning needs were met through these um, online events. And it's a really great way to connect people with each other, to connect patients who have gone through this experience with um, patients that are going through the experience. Um, and then one of the things, again, that was really, really awesome, I think, uh, during uh, the pandemic, and um, which we in integrated into this, uh, this uh, virtual series was Dr. Singh was very generous in giving his time and a lot of energy focused on virtual um, series of COVID-19 and cancer webinar series. We did seven of these, and this was really, really critical during COVID because Dr. Singh was able to really present the latest evidence. He talked about how to get vaccines, where to get vaccines, what vaccines meant in the context of having cancer, the safety of the vaccines, the efficacy of the vaccines, you know, um, uh, any questions people had around concerns, how the variants were changing. 
And um, again, these were very, very well attended. And there were lots of great questions and lots of um, excellent information that was provided really in a very timely way. So this was another thing that we integrated. And hopefully we're far, far away from that. We're not going to have to do a repeat of these. But um, this was absolutely something that um, really um, sort of started us off in the virtual patient education world and started our efforts off in this area. So that's really it for me. Um, I know that we probably have a few questions, which I think Dr. Law will facilitate, but really what I want to leave you with um, is um, thinking about whether you have any new ideas of how we deliver education specifically, like generally, and also if there's any ideas you have about delivering virtual education, any recommendations, and the way that you can uh, connect with us is to either go to sunnybrook.ca slash uh, forward slash cancer education, or feel free to email us at patienteducation at sunnybrook.ca. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you have um, specifically about cancer information or any suggestions you might have. So I'll stop there, Calvin, and uh, I'll hand it over to you for, uh, for the questions. That's uh, absolutely fantastic, Tamara. We, uh... We love the pearl with its curved glass right at the prominent entrance of the cancer center. So I definitely encourage everyone to take that information and go from there. So on that note, Tamara, I'm going to ask you to stop the sharing so this panel can be seen. I'm going to ask the panel to um, uh, come off uh, to to uh, come off a of video mute uh, so that uh, uh, the audience can see you. Um, we are going to start our. Uh, question and answer a portion of this evening now and we've already got some questions i'm going to start trying to collate them and 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 assigning them to our different uh panel members if you still have questions you're still free to submit them now on the online portal and we encourage you to do so and um and just to start it off i think there's two questions here uh, that uh i think have some relation to each other so i'm going to bundle them together I'm going to start taking a short stab at it. And as a heads up, I'm going to tell Ruby and Angela, I'm going to pass it right over to them afterwards. But the questions are this. So one is, how can I be sure that my privacy is secure? But the other question, which is sort of related, is, is it OK to record virtual visits? So I can tell you that at Sunnybrook, we use a, a version of Zoom that is not the free Zoom. We actually have to pay money <laughs> to get a licensed version of Zoom that is actually designed for healthcare and has been certified by the Ministry of Health for use in, in virtual care. There was a time where the only certified program for use in Ontario was the Ontario Telehealth Network. And I'm glad to say that um, the government has certified other commercial vendors such as Zoom to be able to do this. Now, what's different about it though is the following. Number one, the recording mode is usually turned off because you don't want us recording you similarly it's not really a natural thing to record your uh, conversations about your health. And we don't want any ability for something nefarious for somebody to record it. And sometimes, to be honest, we have family members and not everyone has the permission to do it. So the platform itself does not have uh, the recording enabled. The second thing for those of you who are more techie is that when you get the healthcare secure version of Zoom, there's no record of your IP address or where you called in from, or what computer you use to connect to your appointment. Zoom doesn't have it. We don't have it. Nobody has it. So uh, your private computer or wherever you are is, is yours alone. There's no record that people can dig into afterwards. So there is that kind of privacy. Now listen, just like in an in-person appointment, I'm not going to bring a video camera in uh, to, to talk to you, but similarly, you can bring a voice recorder and do it. I think that nothing's there to stop you from turning on your device and record it, but I hope as conscientious and collegial human beings, we would tell each other if we're recording something um, and, and to ask each other, uh, you know, if, do you have permission to do so or not? So that, that would, that in a way, these virtual appointments are virtually the same as in person, um, just that the platform itself won't facilitate that recording. So on that note, I, I thought I'd, maybe throw that over to Ruby and Angie and say, are there any additional sort of non-technology based uh, things that you can assure our audience about their privacy or how they can conduct their operations? Maybe I'll start with you, Ruby. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when we talk about our uh, booking process and the email notification, I think it's important to note that we put minimal personal health information in those emails. At most, it is your name. 
Um, so we keep that to a minimum. And then in terms of the way that our Zoom clinics are set up, there's multiple safeguards. So the waiting room is one to ensure that your privacy um, is there and you're not running into other patients. It's one of the reasons why our virtual coordinators admits each patient one by one. Um, we also have safeguards in our clinic rooms to ensure that you're not that you uh, don't actually go back into the waiting room and run into another patient. Um, in Zoom, if you're familiar with it, there is a chat function that is disabled between patients as well. So you're not able to see other people's names. Um, so there are a few uh, safeguards within the clinics themselves to ensure that um, everything is private and secure. Great. Angie, any further comments from your point of view? I, I actually don't have anything to add. I was going to recap Ruby's Perfect. comments. Okay. Thank you. Well, I hope that helps assure people and also give them an understanding of how this uh, platform works. Um, I think another one, uh, uh, another question that would be interesting, I'm going to throw this over to you, Simran, is uh, a question is, you know, is the only reason we're having virtual care because of ongoing worry about COVID-19? Uh, or or what? And maybe I thought I'd ask you because obviously you have a provincial leadership role. So here, the province, knock on wood, which I guess the only available wood I have right now is my own head. Uh, but if we're coming out of COVID, how do you see that? Or what's your perspective for the province in terms of where you think the ministry should lead public health care? Yeah, thanks, uh, Calvin. Thanks for the question. Um, I guess I would say yes and no. Um, we were really slow in our uptake on virtual care in the province, to be quite honest. We could have done a better job uh, before COVID because, um, as we heard in, in today's uh, presentations, you know, it can be really helpful for some people, the travel, the time, child care, elder care, uh, parking costs, um, trying to fit this into your life. It can be very difficult. So we probably could have done more. Uh, the pandemic gave us, you know, for lack of a better term, part of me if, is a kick in the butt to get this going. Um, so I do think um, we are going to have virtual care ongoing. Uh, you know, some of the work that Ruby is doing and Angela is doing is trying to figure out that right balance of virtual care and how do we make sure it is done uh, well. Um, but uh, it's the, the COVID pandemic. This is one of those rare things that uh, maybe we come out of the pandemic a bit better in terms of we've got a more robust system. We understand virtual care more and we understand how to do it in a way that's more person centered than we did before the pandemic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Simone. Um, this one is a little bit more general question. Sorry, Ange, I'm going to throw this one at you and you can throw it back at us. But the question is, um, you know, in cases where even though we have virtual care available, if somebody says, you know, I really want to come in person, what, how, what, what's their approach if they were called up being offered a virtual care appointment? So certainly um, if they've been booked, say preemptively by the physician as a virtual, then what happens is as Ruby mentioned, the email reminder goes out at the time the appointment's booked, there'd be an opportunity then to reach back out to the cancer center to say, hey, I'm not sure what this is. This looks like a video appointment. I don't wanna do this. Um, if at the time, if that were missed, by example, we have our virtual coordinators who will call 48 hours before the appointment. Um, they'll have a conversation with you. They may learn that your reason for not wanting the virtual appointment is just because you're concerned about the tech technical aspects of it. And they're very reassuring and will guide you through that. If there's other reasons why you just you'd rather be in person and maybe not something you want to discuss with the virtual coordinator, what they will do is contact the physician directly and let them know that you are uh, declining the virtual appointment. You prefer something in person and then the physician will re-enter the appointment for an in-person uh, appointment or or they may choose to call you and have a conversation and explain why they'd like to proceed with video okay that's great and i think it helps reassure the audience that you're not really trapped into one or the other and and similar to what i was trying to say in my talk we're trying to integrate it into the totality of the care that you have so it's yet another option in optimizing your care that you don't um and and i think that 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 i hope reassures our audience for this evening that that uh, that is something that that they have at least 
May, um, may I also, yeah, yeah. sorry, Calvin, may I also add that sometimes the reverse happens. So you have an in-person appointment booked and you prefer video. Yeah. So um, we've had those situations as well, um, certainly where they they contact the physician and then we can book uh, these one-off appointments uh, for video as well. So That's great. A really good point. Works in reverse. And 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 again, if we do it right, people have options and they have a little bit more flexibility. And I, Ruby, your story was great about how somebody uh, did it over lunch or things like that. I certainly um, had one experience where somebody was just getting their checkup report and it was good news. And uh, they talked to me from the car, but not one that was moving. Um, they talked to me from the car because instead of waiting at the hospital, they were be, they were able to be with their child at their championship hockey game, which obviously is awesome. And they just had to run out to their car privately to talk to me on their iPhone, which was flipping awesome. I loved it. I was cheering for that hockey team, whatever that was already. Anyways, um, here's another one that I thought maybe I'd ask both Mary and Simran, but um, it, it's really a question of if virtual care is being so used now or the virtual platform, is is it really, uh, do we still need to research it? Uh, do we? What do we need to learn or is this just going to be a new norm? And I guess I thought I'd ask one version of that to you, Tamara, in terms of learning how to educate patients. That's something that you've done so much work on and then some run just from the system perspective so maybe i'll start with you tomorrow yeah i mean i think that um you know we we actually there's a bit of a gap in terms of um i would say patient education research and in terms of um you know the effectiveness and connecting it with you know the delivery of education but certainly um, I can say that there has been um, much more of a, a, a need for it and request for it. And we do a lot of evaluations. So I would say that the evaluation that the evaluation that we've done to date on all of our classes, um, and we've compared data from the classes we delivered virtually versus the classes that we delivered in person. And we actually do this both from a perspective of the healthcare provider and all from the perspective of patients and families. And we see that, in fact, they're very um, uh, similar. And sometimes we see that um, the feedback that we receive around the virtual um, pieces is even more positive. So, you know, so the outcomes are the same in terms of what we're looking at. Information is still being, um, you know, processed and, and taken in and people are saying that they're learning, they understand. And sometimes we measure, when we measure patient education, we look at, um, we look at anxiety as also, does it help in terms of lowering people's anxiety about, let's say, getting treatment for chemotherapy. That's one of the things that we've measured. And those are very similar, whether it be virtual delivery or whether it be in-person delivery. Um, you know, and then when we see that there may be an issue, we course correct. So the example I gave was, for instance, in the context of lymphedema, where we were seeing that, you know, we really saw a huge drop in participation. And we really do think that that's connected with the visit to the clinic. So um, a lot of this, um, really, I think the key piece in this, Calvin, is making sure that we are attending to things like um, health literacy in whatever mechanism we deliver it. So making sure that people can actually understand the information and the barrier is not about, I don't understand the information. We want to take care of all of that for you. We want to make sure you have the information, you understand it, and it can really enable you to participate in your care. That's awesome. Simran, you're a researcher as well as, as just a healthcare leader. Do we, what do we need to, do we still need to learn about this or, or what do you think? I would say absolutely. You know, we're still learning as this goes along. I mean, yes, virtual care is going to be here to stay, uh, some element of it, but we still can learn how to improve it. We can learn how to improve the experience, both for patients and for providers. Um, in terms of optimizing virtual care. And I think we still have work to do in terms of equity, you know, making sure that virtual care is accessible to all and that some of the barriers that people may have, that we figure out ways around it so everybody has an equal opportunity to be part of a virtual care uh, teamwork. So I think there's a lot to be done uh, still. And I think that's, so yes, we're going to continue a virtual care, but yes, also I think it should still be studied. Yeah. Wonderful. You hit, a, you hit a little word that was a perfect segue to my next question. 
uh, which is always, and I say this out of humbleness, and I, I know many of you feel the same way, but when we use that word equity, we say it with a, a little bit of trepidation because what do we mean by equity, especially to those people who haven't felt like they had equity to say that, oh, I've solved your equity problems can be so difficult. And I certainly look at that way. I often say, hey, you know what? The virtual health, as you guys heard in my talk, it, you know, the virtual has really eliminated some of these barriers, but it does introduce other things. You need the technology, you need the other things. And, and so we do take that seriously. And I struggle sometimes with that term equity, but we've also had the good side Email reminders for some of my patients where English is not their first language has been a godsend because they can read better than they can understand when somebody calls them on the phone and uh, they can also share with their family. And, and I think one thing that is probably a little early to talk about, but there's been an integration of translators uh, directly into the, the Zoom, which has been wonderful because it's actually, I have found it easier to have a Zoom video translator talking to each other um, than it was just sometimes on a grainy speakerphone. But uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll throw it out to uh, to Edge again about you know any perspectives of uh, what do you think is like how are we getting closer to equity on this and maybe some areas that we need to keep on the radar to make this truly an equitable um, service. Well, I think certainly um, from the perspective of once we're on the Zoom platform, being able to call out to the individual. Yeah, so cool. if someone does not have a cell phone or does not have access to a laptop um, or computer, we can call out to their home phone line, even if it's a landline. Um, and what it does, it, it, it doesn't interrupt the flow at our end because we're keeping it on the same platform but it also if from an equity perspective you are able to remain in your home you don't have to come in for parking you don't have to travel uh pay travel costs and and we're able to offer it that way i think that's just one other example i think people think they have to have the smartphone the laptop or the, the home monitor computer and, and SB a Mac and all that, you don't. We will, and I, I was very deliberate in the slide I put up that showed the home telephone as well, because there are um, there are uh, people in our population that, that, you know, are more comfortable with that and just want to speak on the phone. And that's totally fine. Yeah. And our virtual coordinators will cover all of that. They'll assess your needs 48 hours before uh, they talk to you to find out if you do need interpreter services. What what are you most comfortable with? Do you want us to call you? Uh, that kind of thing versus you calling in. Whatever's going to help facilitate that. Thanks, Ange. I, I think those virtual care coordinators have made such a difference. We're, we're we're all so grateful for you and Ruby to help us organize that. And I think that is something that's different. That there's an additional person helping with the virtual flow, not just some random call from a healthcare provider all of a sudden, and, and you're scrambling to, to get on this call. Any other thoughts from the panelists about equity, anything else that we should think about or, 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 or uh, heads up about? Okay. I'll throw this one at you, uh, Simran. This, this is a fairly, I hope, straightforward question, but it, it also shows you that sometimes we uh, think of our concepts a little differently. Uh, this uh, audience member is wondering, uh, so I'm on a virtual call and I need medications. Can they be sent to your home? And uh, I'll let you answer that given you're the medical oncologist on this panel. Yeah, and, and the answer is many times yes. I mean, this is again part of this development of us understanding the cancer journey and making sure that we take into account these different parts about you know integrating uh, allied health and nursing care and physician care all together and making sure working as a team approach and part of that is pharmacy is working together with our pharmacy colleagues and and trying to figure out pathways of, of making sure that you can get lab work done close to your home you can get some tests not all but some tests close to your home and potentially some medications. You can get prescriptions sent directly to your pharmacy. You can get even some of your cancer medications we carry out. So absolutely, I think the whole team is dedicated to, again, this concept, as Tamara said, about person-centered care. Um, and part of that is delivery. Now, it may not be possible in all situations, and hopefully as time goes on, we're going to continue finding solutions, um, but definitely it is it is an option. That's great, Simone. I think that even if it isn't uh, research we're doing, we're still learning and we're still constantly improving. So, 
Well, we're almost near our end of the time, and I'm looking at our uh, our uh, uh, chat there, and I think that we've answered most of our public's questions uh, already. I, I'd have to say um, I'm very, very grateful to our wonderful panel to, to show like the breadth of virtual work. It's not just about a phone call to your home. It's a lot more than that, and we hope to see that this really turns out to be something that really improves care. Not just that salvage thing during COVID-19, which was trying to make sure you didn't come in here, but it, it now I think it's blossoming into something that we hope is a value add to your care. It allows our team to reach you in places that uh, we didn't before. And it allows us to actually increase our capacity a bit because now we have rooms that are virtual, not just rooms that we can build uh, on, on the ground. Um, I will really ask our audience out there, thank you for joining us tonight, but please take a moment to fill out the electronic evaluation form that's on the website that you use to join us tonight. This really helps us to constantly improve our speaker series and to help us also plan future talks and topics that are relevant to our community. Um, you can also add your name to the mailing list for future talks uh, as well, because we'd love for you to be informed. And as you know, all the major programs at Sunnybrook give their own uh, speaker series throughout the year. And uh, we're always delighted every spring to bring the cancer program forward as well. Um, finally, you know what, again, guys, thank you so much for your time, for spending your evening with us, to share, for sharing your expertise. Uh, Lisa Bursuk, thank you so much for uh, being with us as a member of our board and, and to uh, start the evening off and also um, really uh, encouraging that our board is there with us to see and, and participate in all that we do. Uh, big thanks to all our audience members for attending and also for everyone that submitted their very interesting questions that allowed us to really flush this out some more. Again, please look at the website for all the upcoming topics, which I think are just fantastic. I, outside my program, I often learn tons of stuff from the speaker series and I tell my family to also uh, uh, join in and, uh, and, and learn uh, so much. Also remember many of the previous talks are archived on there. So there may be something that you can find from a previous talk that would be very relevant to you. And on that note, may all of you have a wonderful evening. Um, uh, for most of you, go Leafs. For Dr. Singh, go Oilers. <laughs> and on that playoff note, may you all have a nice rest tonight. I hope this evening was good for you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much once again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.